All right, we're opening up our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 62. If you'd like to open up there with me, please. We'll get right into the teaching time. Isaiah 62, and we're just going to read two verses kind of as a, a springboard here into the subject. And I've entitled this message, The Highway of Holiness. The Highway of Holiness. Isaiah 62 and verse 11. Indeed, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world, say to the daughter of Zion, surely your salvation is coming. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, And you shall be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. And guys, I'm going to ask you to turn off the heaters up front because I know I'm going to get hot up here. If they're on. I'm not sure if they're on. It's okay if the back ones are on, but it gets really warm up here uh, with the body heat and then also with the stage lights. So thank you, gentlemen. They shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. You shall be called sought out and sitting not forsaken. Of course, this is speaking of the coming kingdom age uh, where righteousness will dwell and justice and peace will flow like a river when Jesus is ruling and reigning over Jerusalem and over all the earth. We've been studying this uh, throughout the book of Isaiah. I encourage you to listen to the uh, verse-by-verse studies that we have been uh, making our way through the book of Isaiah on Wednesday nights. If you haven't been here or you haven't listened to those messages, I encourage you to go back and listen to them. They're all online. Uh, on our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, etc. Uh, but there is another application here that we as God's people, as the people of God through faith in Christ under the new covenant, that we also uh, are called a holy people as his church, as his bride. We are truly those who have been redeemed. He purchased us with his blood. He bought us back uh, from sin and from Satan. Uh, and bought us back to God with his blood. He purchased us on the cross of Calvary. So we have been redeemed. He's paid our ransom, as it were, to set us free from our captivity and our bondage uh, of sin and of the flesh. And we are now sought out by God, and and we are no longer uh, forsaken as Gentiles in the world. We've been brought near to God through Jesus Christ, his Son. Now, it is interesting as we're going to look at the uh, subject of holiness here this morning, and it's interesting that the word holy in the Bible and the word holiness uh, really pertain to the character and nature of God. So when you see in the Old Testament the word holy used or the word holiness used, it's usually ascribed and credited to God himself. It's his nature. It's who he is. Uh, It's his character. It's what defines him, holiness. The uh, Strong's Concordance tells us the definition of the Hebrew word kadesh. Kadesh is the Hebrew word for holiness, and it's a a variation uh, of the word uh, kadosh, which is holy. And basically, holiness and holy come from the same uh, root word, and they mean the same thing. Basically, sacred, clean or cleansed, consecrated, dedicated, undefiled hallowed, prepared, purified, sanctified, uh, and set apart. So, so you think about that, and that's how God defines himself to us and revealed himself right from the very beginning to the children of Israel and Moses on Mount Sinai, that he is holy and that he is righteous and that he is pure, that he is clean. And, and so he calls us to be that Two, as we are his people, we are called by his name. He calls us Christ ones. If you're called a Christian here today, you are called a Christ one. That's what Christian means. You're one of Christ. You belong to him. He's in you and you are in him. And so because of this, we are told in 1 Peter in chapter 1, you don't have to hold your place there uh, in Isaiah 62, but I'll read this to you. In 1 Peter in chapter 1, And verse 13, in the New Testament, this is what Peter tells us about our position before God. 
1 Peter 1.13, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. In other words, you're not going to be doing the same things you used to do in ignorance, your former lusts before you were saved. He says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy In all your conduct. This is the New Testament to you and I, to the church. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here on earth in fear. Remember, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The awe, the reverence, the respect for God, the fear of the Lord. And and we, we, we fear hurting God. We fear disappointing God. We fear letting Him down. We fear that we will be a stumbling block to others and they'll trip over us because we're a bad testimony, a bad witness for Christ. Uh, We fear that all of our works when we stand before Jesus at the Bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ, not to be judged for our sins. Our sins were taken care of on the cross, but to be judged for our works that we might be rewarded as we go into eternity. Fear that everything that we've done is all a bunch of phony baloney hypocrisy and it's all going to burn. The wood, hay, and stubble is going to burn through the refining fires and only those things that are done for God in the flesh with the right motives will remain. And those are the gold, the silver, and the precious stones that will go on into eternity and so it's the fear of the Lord the reverence for God the respect for God uh, that keeps us uh, holy it keeps us in a place where we 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 don't continue in the same ways we used to live and doing the same things and going to the same places and associating with the same people and if that change has not taken place in your life If you're still going to the same places as you did before you were saved, doing the same things, hanging out and associated with the same people that you did before you were saved, then perhaps you're not really actually saved. Because if you were saved, you couldn't continue to live that lifestyle anymore. Why? Because now you are declared holy. You're set apart. You're sanctified. You're consecrated unto God. You're made clean. And he has given you his Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God himself to take up residence within you so that you are not conformed to a set of rules and regulations, but you are transformed by the renewing of your mind because the Spirit of God dwells within you and you no longer, no longer want to do the things that you used to do. You no longer want to go to the same places uh, where you used to go before you were saved. In the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter uh, 12 and verse 10, I'll read this to you. Hebrews 12:10 tells us this. For indeed, for a few days they chastened us, speaking about our earthly fathers who disciplined us for our good. They chastened us as seemed best to them, but he, God, chastens us for our benefit or for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Very interesting that God disciplines us to make us holy. He chastises us and chastens us as a father who loves us. Matter of fact, Hebrews says if God does not discipline you, you're not his son or daughter. The evidence that you belong to him is that you can't get away with the stuff you used to get away with. You're like, well, I get away with everything. I don't ever get busted for anything that I do. And I know it's wrong. I do it anyways. Life is fine. Well, actually, again, you probably need to come to Christ for true repentance, salvation, and to truly be born again. Because if you are a child, then he must discipline you as a son and a daughter. If you're not disciplined, then you are not a son or daughter, according to Hebrews chapter 12. And he disciplines us for our profit, for our good, so that we might be partakers of his holiness. Look, sin destroys us, and God wants to keep us from destroying ourselves and destroying everybody around us. The alcoholic doesn't just destroy himself, his liver, his heart, his body. He destroys his relationships his, his family uh, is destroyed by alcohol. Drugs, the same thing. You don't just destroy yourself. You're destroying everybody uh, that's around you, that's close to you. No man is an island. None of us live in a vacuum. We all influence and impact those around us. And so God is always trying to call us to holiness. He's trying to call us to righteousness. He's trying to call us that when we slip and we fall, uh, that we would skin our knees but get back up. A righteous man falls and gets back on his feet seven times, the book of Proverbs says. And it's the Lord who strengthens us. And the Lord picks us back up on our feet and he dusts us off and he gets us back on the straight 
and narrow path that leads to life. It is the path of holiness, the highway to holiness. We read, no chastening, Hebrews 12, 11, seems to be joyful for the present. Indeed, it doesn't. When you're being disciplined and you're being spanked by the Lord, it's not pleasant. He says, but painful, but nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed Pursue peace, verse 14, with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. He says, be ye holy, for I am holy. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to the New Testament first here this morning, then we'll go back to the Old Testament, because some people go, well, that's the Old Testament that doesn't apply to us when you talk about holiness or the fear of the Lord and, and, and these sorts of ideas of God. It's like, well, that was, God was mean and mad in the Old Testament. He's nice and friendly. No, it's the same God. God doesn't change. He says, I am the Lord. I change not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our relationship with God has changed certainly through Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary, but God has never changed. He will always be holy. He will always be righteous and pure. And the New Testament writers and authors and disciples, they understood this very, very well. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 1, we read this. Finally then, brethren... We urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you received from us how you ought to walk, walk out your Christian life, and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. And that word sanctification could be translated holiness. It's the same idea. Sanctification means that it was consecrated and set apart for God's Use. He's calling us to be sanctified. This is the will of God, your sanctification, your holiness, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. That includes all sexual immorality, which includes all sex outside of a monogamous relationship uh, with a man and a woman, a, a male and a female biological male and a biological you have to be real careful today and you have to be real you know detailed on what you mean when you even say male and female god says if it's you know uh, you're born a boy you're a boy if you're born a girl you're a girl and and i'm sorry for all the confusion that's out there in the culture but uh, god is not confused as to gender and, and god says that a, a monogamous heterosexual marriage is the only marriage that he recognizes and this is not even popular to say from the pulpit anymore but it's the truth so he says, this is, this is for your sanctification. You should abstain from sexual immorality. And sexual immorality is all sex outside of a heterosexual monogamous marriage. One man, one woman come before God, make their vows before God, and keep their vows till death do us part in sickness and in health, for better, for worse, uh, for richer, for poorer. And, 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 they, and they stay in that position before God. That is, is, is honored. And there's uh, uh, no defilement and, this, and the marriage bed is undefiled Hebrews 13 tells us that it's sanctified by God but everything else is, is sexual immorality the Greek word is porneo from which we get the English word pornography from and so that would, this would include pornography this would include uh, uh, homosexuality this would include uh, any of the other uh, deviant sexual behaviors that God in Romans chapter 1 tells us are not okay before God now look some people have come out of a, 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 a uh, perverted lifestyle or they've come out of an addiction to pornography or, or they've come out of a homosexual lifestyle and they could be washed and cleansed and, and they could be born again and they could be restored. But the Bible doesn't say you can continue to practice that lifestyle. That's called porneo. That's called sexual immorality. And the Bible says that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God in First. Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 and 10. So we're being told here, this is God's will, that you're sanctified, that you abstain from sexual immorality. I think it's really an important message in our culture today, especially for, for the young people, but also sadly for the older people too. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification or consecration and honor. Speaking of our bodies, our vessels, because our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Where we go, God goes. He's in us. He's with us everywhere we go. And so we should possess our own vessel in sanctification and in honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, 
that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such as we forewarned you and testify, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. So sexually, he's called us to holiness and to abstinence. If you're not married and you're single, God has called you to abstinence and to just be a, a eunuch who is on fire for Jesus, not distracted uh, with the cares of, uh, of the world and the cares of marriage and so forth. First Corinthians chapter 7, Paul talks about this. Paul says it's better uh, that you remain like me, single, because otherwise, if you get married, you're going to have trouble in the flesh. But, you know, the idea is that whatever condition, whatever state you find yourself in, be content in the state that you're in. If you're married, be content to be married. If you're not married, be content to be single. And, and, and the Lord can uh, bring you a spouse if he chooses to do that if you're single. And if you're married, he calls you uh, to be a godly husband and a godly wife in that marriage. So it's purity, it's holiness, it's, it's sanctification of the vessel, of the body. Why? Because he purchased us. He bought us to himself with his blood. And he's given us his Holy Spirit to live within us. In verse uh, chapter thirteen and uh, chapter three and verse thirteen, he says, "So that he may establish your hearts." First Thessalonians three thirteen, just a few verses earlier. So he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. John tells us in First John that. He, we who have the hope of the return of Jesus Christ, the coming of Jesus Christ, if we have this hope, we will purify ourselves even as he is pure. He is pure, therefore he calls us to purity. He says, you establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, you know what's interesting is, it, what I just read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7, verse 8 says this, Therefore, he who rejects this, the idea of monogamous heterosexual marriage, the one who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. And far be it for me that I'm ever going to teach you something that's not from the Bible, or leave out something and not tell you what is in the Bible. So if, if, if you reject this message... You're not rejecting me, you're rejecting God, because I didn't write this. God wrote this. It's, it's the Word of God. <clears throat> in Ephesians in chapter 4, we, one more New Testament passage for you on holiness. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22, Paul the Apostle tells us that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, God is never going to command you to do something, command me to do something that, that's not possible. So if God calls you to holiness, then he will give you the power to be holy. If he calls you into righteousness, then he will give you the tools necessary and the power necessary to live a righteous life. But you have to put off the old man. You have to put off the things of the flesh. You have to stop living for the things of this world and loving the things of this world. And you have to start living for eternity, eternity and eternal things and start living for the kingdom of God. And then God will do the work in you and he will refine and he will purify and he will sanctify and he will consecrate. Now we read back in Isaiah, back in the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 3, there's this beautiful prediction and prophecy of the future glory of Zion and Jerusalem, really the millennial reign of Christ, the kingdom age, which a lot of Isaiah uh, uh, it teaches on and expounds and uh, reveals to us. But we read this in Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 3. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful and fearful hearted, be strong and do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. This is Isaiah 35. We're in verse 5. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf 
shall be unstopped, and the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For waters shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of jackals where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. In other words, the curse is going to be reversed when Jesus Christ is here and he's ruling and reigning over the earth. And then this is what we read in verse 8. A highway shall be there and a road, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away." So it's this, it's this highway, it's this road that you could travel on now, the highway of holiness. And you, you notice here that it, it is a road, it is a path. And remember Jesus taught us that there are two roads that you could be on. There's a narrow road, which is a hard road, and there's only a few that find it. And then there's a broad road, which is an easy road, and there's many on the broad road. But he says that one of them is a hard road. It's like, it's like a highway that's climbing up a hill, and it's difficult, and, and, and it's lonely. There aren't very many people on this hard road. But this is the road that leads to eternal life. You're going up, 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 all the way to heaven. In the end, you're going to be with Jesus in heaven. Or you could take the easy road, the broad road. There's a lot of people on the broad road. There's only a few on the narrow road. But the broad road is a gently sloping downhill grade. Very comfortable and easy. It's not hard. There's a lot of people with you. You're not alone. But that broad road leads to hell. It goes down to hell. This is a highway. It, a highway really was, uh, especially uh, in ancient times, it was a road that they built up so that people could travel quickly. The Romans were actually really good about building these highways. That's why they said all roads lead to Rome, where they, you could go anywhere in the Roman Empire uh, without really having to worry about uh, having clean roads, having um, well-repaired roads and roads that you could travel on quickly because the Roman uh, government wanted to be able to send their armies anywhere in the Roman Empire, you know, within just a very short period of time. So they, when they conquered a nation, they built a road and they made sure that that road led back to Rome. All roads lead to Rome. That's where the phrase came from. But it was, it was so that you wouldn't get bogged down. You know, we think about like the freeways going through L.A. Uh, the idea was is that you would travel fast on the freeways through L.A., not so much in reality, of course, there's too many cars on the freeways in L.A., but it was the idea that you don't have to go through traffic stops and traffic lights and stop signs and stoplights. It's a, it's a highway. It's above the other roads. It's built up so that you could go quickly from one point to another. And so this is a, a, a road. It's a pathway. It's a highway. It's, it's a road where you're not getting bogged down. You're not getting caught up in all of the things that are going on beneath you. You're on your way. You are on your mission from God, and it is a highway of holiness. And so it's the idea of living a holy life, of living a sanctified life, of living a life that is set apart for God, a life where you are denying uh, your flesh. Jesus says, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow after me. It is, it is self-denial and it's self-mortification. It's mortifying the flesh. It's crucifying the flesh, not feeding the flesh, not pampering the flesh, not you know, just giving the flesh whatever it wants, but it's denying the flesh and it's crucifying the flesh and it's following Jesus, the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. No, this is only for those who are walking in a holy lifestyle. Uh, there's no lion there, verse 9. Interesting. The enemy really can't touch you. Remember the enemy's like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8. Uh, and so Peter says, be vigilant, be sober. Understand you've got an enemy out there. He's very powerful. He's watching all the time. He, he's patiently waiting to strike when you let your guard down. And, and, and here this highway of holiness for those who are living a holy life, walking on that straight and narrow path, no lion shall be there nor any ravenous beast. 
You know, the enemy really can't touch you when you are completely set on fire for God, when you are sanctified and set apart for God. Oh, he can try and he can, you know, send people to try and hurt you or accuse you or, or, or harm you. The devil is the God of this world with a little G, but really he can't touch you in your heart, in your soul, in your mind. You have the mind of Christ. You have the armor of God put on every day. And you are on your mission from God. Not my will, but thy will be done. Every day is another opportunity to say, Lord, what would you have me to do this day? I'm yours. I'm available to you. The highway of holiness. He says, no beast shall be there. It shall, shall not be found there. Verse 9. But the redeemed shall walk there and the ransomed of the Lord shall return. So we are those who are redeemed back to God. We've been purchased back to God. Jesus bought us with his life, with his blood poured out on the cross of Calvary. He saved us from ourselves. He saved us from sin. He saved us from death. He saved us from hell. He saved us from Satan. He has saved us for himself. And God says, be ye holy, for I, the Lord, am holy. We read in Isaiah chapter 6. You remember as we have studied through this great book of Isaiah, Isaiah had this vision of heaven where God took him into the very presence of God, the very throne room of God. And he had this incredible experience of seeing God in his glory, in his holiness, uh, in his, his power. Isaiah 6 and verse 1, we read this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And so Isaiah, the prophet of God, who would be given more revelation really than any other Old Testament prophet about Jesus Christ, the first and second coming of Jesus Christ, and then the eternal reign of Christ forever and ever. He has this vision of heaven. He sees the throne of God. You see the seraphim. You know, the, there's the cherubim and there's the seraphim, the two orders of angels that are, are uh, taught in the scriptures to us. And, and the seraphim are the ones that have six wings. They are before the throne of God. With two wings, they uh, cover their face. With two wings, they cover their feet. And with two wings, they fly before the throne of God. While God is sitting on his throne, and, and all that they could say before the throne of God is holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. That's all they can say because they're in his presence and he is holy. And they can't even look upon his holiness so they must cover their eyes because he's too holy for them to look on. These are the angels can't even look upon him. They cover their face. The feet would be defiled in, in, in ancient culture. You walk around in sandals and barefoot and walk through animal manure on the streets and so forth. So the feet were dirty. That's why Jesus washed his disciples' feet. He says, if, uh, your, if your feet are clean, then, then you are clean. If Jesus washed your feet, uh, talking about trampling and walking through this world and getting dirty in this world. But they have their, their wings covering their feet because the feet would be defiled and nothing defiled can come before God. And then with two wings, they are fine. And notice here that it says he covered his face. He covered his feet. There's only three angels mentioned in the Bible. Uh, Gabriel, uh, Michael, and Lucifer. Those are the only three angels named in the Bible. And it's interesting that one third of the angels fell when Lucifer became Satan. And so one third of the three angels represented uh, fell. We know there's billions, likely billions of angels. Only three of them are named for us. They're all males. There are no female angels in the Bible. Whenever it talks about an angel coming, it's either Gabriel, he's a male, it's Michael, he's a male. Uh, or it was Lucifer who became the devil, who was a male. And these angels, these seraphim, are called he. So just a little bit of trivia there for you as you put up angels around your house and so forth. There really are no uh, female angels in the scriptures. They're all male. But he says, one cried to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, this is the prophet Isaiah, the man of God. So I said, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. 
Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, the altar before the throne of God. And he touched my mouth with it, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. And then he calls Isaiah into his ministry, and he says, Here I am, send me. But it, it's, it, it's interesting that this scene in heaven, these angels, all they're doing is worshiping God and declaring how holy he is. And then Isaiah comes and Isaiah is like, wow, I am a mess. I am undone. And Isaiah was a righteous man. He was a good man. He was a godly man. But coming into the presence of perfection, of holy, sinless perfection, he realized, I am unclean. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And of course, the Lord had to cleanse him and take away uh, his iniquity and purge his sin, and especially the sin of his mouth. He touched his mouth because he was going to speak forth the word of God uh, as the prophet of God. Now, we look really uh, probably about 700 years later when John the Apostle was writing the book of Revelation on the Isle of Patmos. And actually, it's, it's even further into history than when John wrote this because John was taken up into heaven in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1 after the church age was over. John was taken up into heaven. He saw the throne of God. And this is what he sees before the throne of God in Revelation 4 verse 8. The four living creatures each having six wings, the same angels, the the seraphim that Isaiah saw back in Isaiah chapter 6, the four living creatures, each having six wings, full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. It's like these angels don't have any other job. For thousands and thousands and thousands of years, all they do is go before God's throne, and they just humble themselves before the Lord and they just declare how holy he is. Holy, holy, holy. And three is, of course, the number of the Trinity. And so the holiness of God before his throne. He's always holy. He's never stopped being holy. He will always be holy. And so we can't uh, um, ask God to change his holiness. He's, he can't change. I'm the Lord. I'm, I'm God. I change not. We have to be the ones who change to become like him. Jesus came down, he took our sins, and he took the punishment for our sins on the cross of Calvary. And then he gives us his righteousness. And we have to walk that righteousness out as a Christian life. It's, it, it's a choice that we make every single day to either live for the flesh or to live for the things of the Spirit. To live for the eternal kingdom of God or to live for this temporal kingdom of this world that's passing away. In the Old Testament times, you even had priests who went before God who were killed by God because they were not properly prepared to enter the presence of God. You remember Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu. They came before the presence of God in a wrong manner. They came and offered him strange fire and they were consumed and destroyed and everybody was afraid because they're like, wow, if this could happen to Moses' nephews, Aaron was Moses' brother. He was the high priest. And Moses, Aaron's sons were killed by God. Because why? Because they came before God in an unworthy manner. And they offered strange fire before the Lord. You remember King Uzziah. He came before God. He tried to come in with the priest. He was the king. The king wasn't allowed to come into the presence of God in the temple. Only the priests were. And the Levites that were there serving. But really only the high priest could go in just once a year into the presence of God. Uh, and the priests were the order that were there to minister on behalf of the people. The priests would come and they'd pray for the people and they would offer sacrifices uh, for the people before God and then they would come from God and teach the people the word of God. And it was a very specific, specified, prescribed manner by which you could come into the presence of God. And the king was so prideful. He was a good king. He was a wealthy king, Uzziah. And he decided, I want to be like a priest. I want to go in before God and offer incense and prayers in the temple. And you remember what happened to him. He was struck with leprosy. And, and he was a leper for the rest of his life. And his son actually had to become a co-regent with him and begin to reign with him because uh, lepers were isolated from society. And he was kept separate until uh, the day he died because he broke the order of God. And he tried to come into the presence of God in an unfit and an unworthy manner. God gives a prescription for how to come into his presence uh, way back for the Old Testament times in the book of Leviticus 
in chapter 16 where we read about the Day of Atonement, the annual Yom Kippur celebration, which was the culmination of all of the other feast days and festivals of the Jews. And this was the one where they would uh, come before God and ask for forgiveness for the nation, for the sins of the nation of Israel every single year. And we read this about uh, Aaron coming before the presence of God on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil, the holy of holies, before the mercy seat which is on the ark, the ark of the covenant, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. And then God gives a very detailed a set of instructions of what Aaron had to do before Aaron could go before God on behalf of the nation and sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice upon the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, which covered up the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, where, which contained the Ten Commandments and um, Moses, uh, Aaron's rod that budded and the manna that they ate in the wilderness, a jar of manna that was all there in the Ark of the Covenant. And, and the Ark of the Covenant represented the very presence of God and, and the Shekinah glory of God was there. And nobody could enter into this place. Only the high priest into the very presence of God only one time a year. And he had to go through all of these cleansings and ceremonial cleansings and animal sacrifices and so forth in order to present himself. Matter of fact, what, they, what tradition tells us is they used to tie a rope around the ankle of the high priest when the high priest, because sometimes the high priest would go into the presence of God. He wasn't ready. He wasn't prepared. His heart wasn't right. He didn't take seriously all of the prerequisites of coming, and he would actually die in the presence of God. Well, nobody could go in there and get him. This is beyond the veil where the Ark of the Covenant is, in the Holy of Holies. Nobody could go, and they would have died too, because God's presence is holy. Man's sinful. You have to follow his prescription. And so they would literally have to pull his body out with a rope. And so they put a rope around, and they actually put tinkling bells on his belt so that they could hear the jingling on the other side of the door and know that he's still alive in there you know they'd hear the bells tinkling they go okay well I guess he's okay he cleansed himself and he did everything right otherwise they'd have to pull him out by a rope because nobody could go into the presence of God except for the high priest except one time a year and there were all of these requirements and prescriptions before prerequisites before you could come into the presence of God God says, tell your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil. It was a very, very sacred thing to come into the presence of God. The blood sacrifices of the Old Testament tell us that really uh, we deserve death. From the very beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned, they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. The fig leaves didn't work, and so God killed animals. That was the first time death had ever occurred in all of creation. There was no death before sin. Sin came in Genesis chapter 3 when man and woman disobeyed the word of God and listened to the voice of the serpent and sin entered the world and death through sin and then death has passed to all men and really all life since then. And an animal was required. Man could not cover up his own sin, cover up his own shame. God had to provide a sacrifice and the sacrifice was an innocent animal in order to clothe, clothe them and to cover their nakedness and their shame because Life is in the blood and the, and the soul that sins shall die and the wages of sin is death and all we have sinned and gone astray. Each of us has gone to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. With Cain and Abel, you remember Abel brought the firstlings from the flock and offered it as a sacrifice to God. God required a blood sacrifice because sin required death. Noah, after the flood, Noah uh, was asked by God, commanded by God, to offer animal sacrifices, a blood atonement for the sins of man. It goes on and on. Moses uh, had to offer the Passover lamb and the children of Israel. Uh, and they had to take a lamb and apply the blood upon the doorposts and the lintels of their house so that the angel of death would pass over them and not kill their firstborn. It was death that was required. The death of an innocent animal. The same thing with Yom Kippur. It was actually two goats were one sacrifice. One of the goat was sacrificed and the blood was brought into the Holy of Holies by the high priest. It's all detailed in Leviticus chapter 16 on Yom Kippur. He'd sprinkle seven times, seven the number of completion or 
perfection, the blood upon the mercy seat or the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And then God accepted the sacrifice if he was, you know, ready and he was prepared and he did it right. And then he would come out and he would declare to the nation, our sins are forgiven and everybody would cheer because God removed the sins and God took away their sins once a year and then they have to do it all over again uh, the next year. The other, uh, the other goat was a, a scapegoat, which they would confess the sins of the nation upon the scapegoat and they would drive it away. So basically, Yom Kippur talks about the atonement for the sins and the removal of the sins of the nation. And of course, all of these sacrifices, all of these blood offerings would have had to continue on if Jesus Christ hadn't come. Jesus Christ came in fulfillment. These were all shadows and types of him. They were pointing the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, to the Messiah who would come so that when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, not just the sins of the nation, not just provides a covering temporarily, a kofar or a covering, like the animal sacrifices provided a temporary covering for sin, but he takes away the sins of the whole world. It was all pointing to Jesus Christ. And it was the blood of Jesus on the cross that paid the price for our sins. And not just for your sins and my sins, but for the sins of the whole world. All who would call upon Christ in faith. He died for the sins of all. Jesus paid the price. Jesus made a way through his blood. Jesus gives us access to the Father, gives us access to the presence of God Almighty. For his blood speaks greater things even than the blood of innocent Abel, we're told in the book of Hebrews. Jesus Christ gave a way. Jesus Christ made a way. Jesus Christ is the way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Again, Jesus teaches about this hard road and this easy road, this wide road and this narrow road. And Jesus exhorts us as his followers to seek to enter through the narrow gate and the narrow road. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches us this. He says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. But narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are only a few who find it. And so we should expect that the road is going to be a hard road. It's not going to be an easy road. But we're not alone. We're not walking this road alone. Jesus is walking this road with us. He's given us his Holy Spirit uh, as his promise that he is coming back again to take us to be with him. And the Holy Spirit is his pledge or his down payment of what is to come which is eternity with him forever and ever in first john chapter one we're told that we're to walk in the light as he is in the light and then we have fellowship with him and we have fellowship with one another and the blood of jesus his son cleanses us from all our sin if we say we have fellowship with him we walk in darkness we lie and the truth is not in us so we have to be those who seek to walk on the hard road the narrow road the road that leads leads to life Go through the narrow gate, walk in the light, live in the light. In 2 Corinthians in chapter 6, Paul tells us that we are bought with a price, that we now belong to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, Paul says this, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial or with Satan? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. I will walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate. The same idea of consecrated or holy or set apart. Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and my daughters, says 
the Lord Almighty. And then chapter 7, verse 1 continues and says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. New Testament. This is what we're called to. We're bought with a price. We don't belong to ourselves anymore. He owns us. He gets to call the shots. Before I was saved, I got to call the shots and I made a mess of my life. Now he's the boss. I'm his bondservant. I'm his slave. He gets to order me around. And you know what? He's a good boss. He's a good slave master. He only wants good for you and for me. And we do ourselves such harm when we disobey that which we know is right and we do that which is wrong as Christians we're most to be pitied, actually. In 1 Corinthians and chapter 6, Paul tells us this. In verse 15. By the way, this is the scripture I was mentioning earlier. You could start in verse 9. <clears throat> Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, those, are those who practice porneo, or sex outside of marriage, or pornography... Sexual deviancy, fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals. This is in the Bible, New Testament. Nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, you can't keep practicing those. It may have been what you did before you were saved, but not after you're saved. If you're going to sin, you should hate your sin. You should fight against your sin and yeah you're going to battle your sin for the rest of your existence here because we live in a sinful fallen world in a fallen body but you're no longer powerless against sin you have the power of God now on your side you have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life you have the power of a new creature a new creation and God says behold uh, all things uh, are made new second Corinthians five seventeen. anyone's in Christ he's a new creation old things are passed away and all things have become new so if the old things aren't passed away in your life, then maybe you're not yet a new creation. You, you need to get saved. He says in verse 11, And such were some of you. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Uh, all of these sins are forgivable, but you can't continue to practice them after uh, you are washed and sanctified and justified. He says this in chapter 6, verse 12. He says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Food for the stomach, stomach for the food, but God will destroy both of them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Think about that. We are the body of Christ. You and I make up his body here on earth. His resurrected body is in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. But we are his body, spiritually, mystically, symbolically, practically. We are his body here on the earth. We are members of the body of Christ. He says, do you not know your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We belong to him now. We don't belong to ourselves anymore. I can't just go and do whatever I want. I have to check in with God first. I have to make sure that my lifestyle is aligning with his word. And again, this is not to condemn anyone. This is not to make anybody, uh, you know, feel guilty or feel condemned, hopefully this will bring conviction to us from the Holy Spirit that we want to get right and stay right with God and not be those who are going down uh, into the cesspool of filth and sexual immorality of our depra depraved culture. Our culture is just completely off the rails uh, when it comes to sexual immorality and we are called to be holy. We have the Holy Spirit who is in us. 
and he is the spirit of holiness. He's, he's sanctified. He is set apart. He is consecrated, and he does that work in you and in me. He's given us his Holy Spirit. Be holy, God says to his people, for I am holy. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2, we read this, this exhortation of the race of our faith, running the race of our faith. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We're going to be struggled, struggling with sin and, and, and caught up and stumbled with sin the rest of our lives. And if it's not your sin, it'll be someone else's sin. Because we're all sinners. That, that didn't really change when we got saved. You still have a sin nature. But now you have the divine nature in addition to the sin nature. And the divine nature, the power of the Holy Spirit is stronger than your flesh. But you just have to submit to the Lord. You can't yield to the lust of your flesh. You have to deny your flesh and you have to yield to the Spirit of God. And he says, lay aside all of our weights and the sins which so easily ensnare us. We're, we're running a race. Don't worry. God will... You know, he'll, he'll take care of you. If he saved you, he's going to see you through to the end. No one can snatch you out of his hand. But he's saying, look unto Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of our faith, and let's just keep our eyes on Jesus and run this race. It's like we're heading to the finish line. Your life is short. My life is short. People get to the end of their lives. They're like, I don't know where all the time went. I'm 90 years old, and it seems like it's just a couple of years ago I was in high school. A few years ago I was in my early 20s and got married and was having my kids and now I'm 85, 90 years old. I don't know where the time went. Understand that we all have a date of death. We all have an expiration date. Just like you had a birth date, you have a death date. You just don't know what the death date is yet. Neither do I. But none of us are going to get out of here alive unless Jesus Christ comes back at the rapture and we get our new bodies. God willing, that will happen soon. But if it doesn't, in a hundred years, none of us will be here. We all have an appointment with death. And Jesus said he's the author. He starts the work in you. And he's the completer. He'll finish the work in you too. It's what are you going to do between your birth date and your death date? Really, what are you going to do with the dash? Right? There's a dash on the, on the tombstone. And that is your life. And what, what did you do with your dash? What did you do with your life? And, and, and we can't do anything about the past. We can repent of it. We could be sorrowful for it. We could regret it. We can learn from it. But today, today if you hear his voice hard and not charged, start living for Jesus today because you just don't know how much time you have. I don't know how much time I have, but I want to be useful to him with the time that he has given me so that when I go before him, he will say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. One more scripture and then we're going to conclude in Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2, some of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Romans 12, 1 says this, I beseech you, brethren, or I urge you, I exhort you, I plead with you, Paul is saying, I beseech you, brethren, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's a living sacrifice that we just continue to die daily. Paul the Apostle said, I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives through me. He says, I die daily. I have to die to my flesh every single day. And so do you and so do I. If Paul had to die daily, so do we. We have to die to the things of our flesh, the things of this world, the things of, uh, uh, of our past. And we have to live for Jesus. We have to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith, and not be hung up with sin, which ensnares us and entangles us and trips us up. And we have to understand that we are called to be living sacrifices. We are called to be holy. We are called to be acceptable to God. And, and Paul says, this is reasonable. It's not too much that God's asking from you. And besides, sin is destroying you anyways. This is good for you. 
It's like eating your vegetables instead of eating all the junk food. It's good for you when your doctor tells you, stop all that junk food and start eating your vegetables. You may not like it. It may not taste as good, but he's trying to help you. You see, God is he's, he's trying to hes trying to lighten our burden and lighten our, our, our load that we carry. And, you know, the, the, the sinner's life is hard. I mean, you have consequences for sin. You, you, you have sowing and reaping with sin. You have, uh, you know, people that, you know, typically that... that, that are living in sin, you're going to be around other people living in sin, and those are dangerous people to you. Those are people the enemy could use to hurt you. So the Lord is just calling us to holiness. He's calling us to be set apart for Him. He's calling us to make up our minds this morning that we are no longer going to walk on that broad road that leads to destruction, but we are going to actively choose to walk on that high way, that path that leads to life, that, that really the end of that road is heaven. Again, guys, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. And old things have passed away and all things have become new. And I encourage you this morning, commit your life to Christ. Dedicate your life to Christ. Be born again. We don't have time to be playing church. We're getting close to the end times. The one world government is coming. The Antichrist is coming. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. We see it all around us. The judgment of God is already upon our nation and we're not turning back to God and things are probably going to get worse for America uh, because we have pretty much rejected the God of the Bible in America overwhelmingly, even sadly in many churches. And so we, we just have to be about our Father's business. Understand that you know your life is short. No matter what your age is, your life is short. 60, 80, even 90 years is a short amount of time compared to eternity. And you don't even know that you're going to have 60 or 80 or 90 years. We're not promised tomorrow. So let's run the race with endurance. Let's keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Let's cast aside all the sins that so easily ensnare us. And God gives you the victory. He gives you the power. Jesus disarmed the powers and principalities when he died on the cross and he rose from the dead. And so Satan has no power over you anymore. Your flesh is powerless over you because you have a greater power inside of you to draw on, which is the power of God's Holy Spirit. Shall we pray? Father, I thank you for your people. I thank you for each one who's listening to this message today, Lord. And I just pray, Lord God, that they would know your love, Father, that we would know that it is your love, Lord, that you call us to this because you love us, Lord. It's your love that sent your son here to die on the cross for our sins. It's, it's your love, Lord God, that you sent your Holy Spirit to take up residence within us, Lord. It's your love letter to us, this book, the Bible, is your love letter to your people, Lord God. It's all about your love for us, Lord, and you call us to love one another even as you have loved us. You tell us, Lord, if you, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And your commandments are not burdensome. Lord, bless your people. Strengthen us, Lord, to resist the wiles of the devil and the allures and the temptations of sin and of this world, Lord God. Help us to unplug from the things that are causing us to stumble, Lord God, and to plug into you, Jesus, more into your word, more into your spirit, Lord. Plug in more into the spirit-filled life, Lord God. And Lord, that we would have your power, Lord, to live this Christian life. Lord, you tell us that your power was going to come upon us, Acts 1-8, Lord. And when your Holy Spirit has come, we'd receive power, Lord, power to be your witnesses, power, Lord, over the flesh and the world and the devil. Bless your people, Father. If anyone doesn't know you, I pray, Lord, that this would be the morning they cry out to you for salvation, Lord. They'd repent, Lord. And you say, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, Lord. Some perhaps need to come back to you today. I pray that this would be the day. They wouldn't put it off till tomorrow, Lord. They'd come and they'd get right with you. Lord, and the rest of us, Lord, just help us to continue to run this race, Father. Help us to keep our, keep our eyes on the prize and use us in a mighty way in these last days, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen.